Well, inflation data continues to spook investors and worry many. We're here to discuss the outlook for the economy as well as which assets are best to protect yourself against a rising inflationary environment. Joining me today is none other than Mark Skousen, esteemed economist, editor of the Forecast and Strategies newsletter. Mark, welcome back. Good to be back, David. Uh, inflation is coming back for sure. And uh, this is one that I predicted. There are a lot of skeptics out there, especially the establishment e e economists who say, oh, this is just a temporary uh, de uh, uh, rally or uh, a rise in inflation. It'll go back down. And so far, the data seems to indicate that uh, there is definitely uh, a major, uh, you know, finally the Federal Reserve is getting its wish, which was to uh, uh, the, their inflation target of raising it to two and a half percent is being achieved and, and, and exceeded. Because one of the things that about inflation is that it's not predictable and it's not steady. It is a very uh, unpredictable, volatile uh, factor uh, that you can't really control. The government has a hard time controlling it. inflation that is price inflation. Well, Mark, you're right in the sense that the Fed has had more than its fill of inflation over the last couple of months. In fact, it's been two or three times in a row now that CPI has more than doubled the Fed's inflationary target of 2%. Now, the question is how long this can last. What's your outlook? Do you think prices will mean revert downward, or do you think 5% and above is here to stay? I think production will increase. The supply chain will respond. I mean, for example, uh, rental cars right now are going for $200 a day, sometimes $1,000 a day, and that's because the rental car companies sold all their car, cars last year and now are having to rebuy them. And there is a chip shortage, so that's causing uh, uh, the supply of automobiles uh, limited and the prices going higher. Uh, I think that will be rectified in the next year or two. Uh, but the government has been so expansionary in their uh, policies, uh, both monetary and fiscal policy, uh, they're increasing demand. They're providing all kinds of um, uh, money at very low interest rates. And that's finally having an effect. Uh, also, people are getting all kinds of unemployment compensation. They're not going back to work. Uh, that is a problem as well. So you put that all together and it's creating an environment that's highly inflationary. I'm predicting a return to the 70s inflationary environment, perhaps even stagflation for a while. So, Mark, the 70s had double-digit inflation. What's going to get us there this time if you think we're going to return to that era? So one re reason was the energy crisis. Uh, we had a huge shortage of energy, and you had OPEC raising prices tremendously, at oil prices, and that's possible to happen. I mean, oil is already up to $75 a barrel. So energy prices rising sharply could be a big factor in pushing other rates up, whether it's food shortages, uh, there's all kinds of events that could occur that that would cause double digit inflation. And uh, boy, what a change considering uh, that we faced a period of deflation that uh, or disinflation that has lasted for many years. So there are a lot of these uh, outlying factors, black swan events that could occur that would rise prices higher. And uh, uh, you know, we had the pandemic uh, that caused the Federal Reserve to expand the money supply dramatically. The money supply went up 26 percent last year. If the door crashes, for example, that's going to cause prices to rise dramatically. So there's a lot of factors that are unpredictable and that could uh, play a role in pushing us back up to double digit inflation. I'm not predicting it. I'm just saying there are these black swan events that could occur. Let me just show two charts here before we move on. The first one shows uh, in red core inflation. And this is uh, courtesy of Bianco Research. I have pulled this off of Twitter. And what they've done here is they've taken uh, CPI, except they've annualized it on a six-month basis. So on a six-month annualized change basis, what you can see is that we're actually at record levels since the 70s. 6.17% is their reading on this chart. Let's go to the next chart. Record level since the 70s. This one shows headline CPI. 
So if you just change the, uh, the way you measure inflation, well, not the way you measure inflation, but the way you roll it, instead of a 12-month basis, a six-month annualized change basis, you can see that inflation is actually already at record levels. So my question is, Mark, what's going to happen to um, what's going to happen to a lot of these uh, a lot of these prices for everyday items that have gone up? We're talking about things like lumber, raw commodities. They've they've come down. Okay, lumber prices mm-hmm. have come down. So raw commodities, some of them have normalized. But what about things like restaurant prices, for example? You know, if consumers are already paying twenty percent extra, what's the incentive for a restaurant to lower the prices back down to pre-pandemic levels? Yeah, d- restaurants, uh, I think it's all demand driven. Uh, people have more money in their pockets. They've gotten from the federal government, from low interest rates, from higher wages. Corporate profits are near all time highs. There's a lot of factors increasing demand. So I don't see restaurant prices declining at all. If anything, they'll go up. But notice in your charts, there's tremendous volatility. Uh, this is why you can't really control inflation. There's ups and downs that go on, and it's based on black swan events, whether it's an energy crisis or uh, a food shortage or, or what have you. So uh, you, you have to you have to look at the underlining trend. In the 70s, the underlining trend was up. Since the 1980s till now, the trend was down. And so we'll just have to see if that's really the bottom. I, I think it is. We've all tried to predict the bottom in interest rates and, and CPI for some time. Well, okay, so if prices of everyday items and discretionary items like restaurant spending, um, leisure, if these things are not going to go back down, like you said, Mark, are you concerned that household discretionary income could be shrunk at the end of the day? And, 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 well, discretionary spending power, not income, because that's just income after taxes, but discretionary spending power, do you think that could be shrunk? And if so, what would happen to the economic recovery? Well, I think it's still, uh, even though prices are rising and so forth, income is rising at a faster pace. And so you have to look at real income. Real assets are rising. And so uh, I I don't think that that is a problem per se. Let's talk about investments now. This is an interesting chart. Let's take a look at this third chart. It shows inflation expectations broken down by age. This is courtesy of the New York Fed. They've done a survey of over 1,300 households, and they've, they were able to break down inflation expectations by three age cohorts, under 40, the red line, 40 to 60, and 60 and over. Interestingly enough, the younger cohort, under 40, had the lowest inflation expectations at 2.9%, and it increases with age. What was your next initial expectation when I showed you this chart? I think that young people don't have a, uh, a sense of history at all. They're thinking that we've lived in this period of deflation that has lasted a long period of time. Older people remember the 1970s and thinking that maybe inflation is coming back on a stronger basis. That's my initial response. I'm really not sure uh, how to interpret uh, this chart, except that all factors, all ages think that uh, inflationary expectations are rising. I think one way to interpret this chart, besides what you've just commented on, is the fact that different age cohorts may have different investment objectives given their inflationary outlook. For example, if I were a younger person and assuming I don't think inflation is a concern, I wouldn't be buying inflation hedges, right? I think that uh, they're who knows what young people are buying? I mean, they're buying these meme stocks, so they, there's no rational behavior. Uh, well, by actually, you're, young you're, you're a professor at uh, you're a professor at Chapman College, so you, you you're you're in this unique situation where your your newsletter subscribers are presumably people older than you know college graduates, but you've also worked with people in college too. So, what what are the differences in investing attitudes between the younger people you've come across and the older people you've worked with? Younger people tend to be more speculative in their attitudes, and that's why they'll play the, the meme stocks uh, and uh, technologies and pre-IPOs and uh, penny stocks. Uh, they're interested in a lot of different investments, while the uh, older people are more interested in the more traditional dividend-paying investments that will give them a good long-term return. 
and are actually prefer stability rather than the volatility that you get that younger people engage in with uh, the technology stocks and and that sort of thing. I do think that uh, one of the biggest disappointments uh, in uh, this era of infl rising inflation is that the precious metals have, have not uh, responded that they they normally do, uh, and even Bitcoin is not is kind of struggling at this point. Uh, one wonders what's going on here. Uh, I've actually favored the technology stocks. We have a very big position in technology stocks, and I did do an historical background and found in the 1970s the Nasdaq stocks doubled and then doubled again. The Dow traditional stocks went nowhere for 10 years or for a decade, but uh, the small stocks and the technology stocks did really well. So I'm really focusing on that right now with uh, the technology fund XLK, which is uh, probably the best performing of the technology funds. The ARK Innovation Fund is not, ARKK is not done as well. So, uh, and XLK has done well because it, its two biggest positions are Apple and Microsoft. And both of them have been uh, uh, technology leaders in this bull market. It's interesting how you commented that uh, younger people like the technology sector. Yeah, you yourself are heavily positioned. Maybe you're you're still in your 20s at heart, Mark. Who knows? But uh, uh, you're right. Technology sectors, uh, the technology sector has done very well in the past, especially during uh, periods of inflation. It's funny because we don't consider technology as an inflation hedge. Would you would you dare to use that term when a when a when, when describing technology stocks? It's not something you normally think of uh, in terms of uh, inflation hedge. Uh, we're just looking at the at what is actually happening, and uh, while the uh, you know Nasdaq is hitting new highs, uh, gold and silver are trending. Especially the mining companies have been trending downward. Bitcoin has not done particularly well recently, and look, technology companies can handle inflation a lot better. Uh, than uh, traditional retail type of uh, pos positions because they can continue to do their breakthrough technologies even with inflation as long as it doesn't get out of hand. So that's why I think that they they are much more versatile in in what they can wake what the way they uh, handle the inflation. Well, I guess again, uh, and you you kind of address this already, but I guess the risk, of course, is. Uh, the possibility of wages not outpacing the rate of inflation. In that case, people would spend less money on Amazon, on Apple purchases, so on and so forth. In that case, I think technology sectors would, uh, the technology companies would realize a reduction in revenue, would they not? Boy, I don't know if that's the case or not. We're talking about real revolution that we haven't really fully uh, played through in the entire cycle. Uh, Amazon is still expanding uh, their their technology and, and how they're cutting costs. Uh, you look at the chip makers and how they have a supply shortage right now. So they're engaged in, in a lot of new changes and so forth. You look at Zoom, you look at Netflix, you look at all of the things that you, you, it's really hard to predict what they're going to be doing uh, several years from now, so I wouldn't I wouldn't count them uh, out at all. All right, so you favor the technology sector at this time, and uh, finally, Mark, let's talk about Freedom Fest. It's coming up. Tell us about it. So Freedom Fest, for the first time, we've moved out of Vegas. We're in South Dakota, the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're meeting in Rapid City near Mount Rushmore. Uh, we have almost uh, 2,500 people who are coming uh, next week, July 21st to the 24th. Uh, if people go to freedomfest.com, they can read and still make reservations and, and join us. Uh, it's, it's just an intellectual feast in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> practically. Uh, and we're going to be talking philosophy, history, science and technology, uh, uh, healthy living. Our theme is healthy, wealthy, and wise. We have the Anthem Film Festival's 10th anniversary. We have a financial conference. And uh, it's it's really going to be a fun event. And I know Kitco TV is going to be there, Newsmax, uh, C-SPAN. There's a lot of uh, media coverage. Uh, 
we're we're really looking forward to getting together uh, and enjoying our freedom for the first time in a year. So uh, we hope to see uh, see a lot of the viewers uh, coming there, and uh, it's it's really going to be a lot of fun. Can you give us a few headliners uh, names just to tease us a bit? Yes, we have Dr. Drew uh, on uh, healthy living. We have John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods Markets. We have Hershey Ali, uh, Ian Hershey Ali, who's a former Muslim talking about the Middle East. We have Steve Moore and John Fund and Grover Norquist talking about supply side economics. One of our fun things we're going to do is our breakout sessions and debates are really good. Our mock trial is going to be on the pandemic. Was was the pandemic severe enough to justify the lockdown? And we have a re mock trial is always one of our more popular events. And we ha we also uh, have a question: What four economists belong on Mount Rushmore? Uh, and even the question on the, the four presidents that we currently have on Mount Rushmore, are they really the ones who deserve to be on Mount Rushmore? So that we're going to have a lot of fun debates and discussions on that issue. So anyway, again, if people go to freedomfest.com, our full agenda is posted there. Uh, we're, we're hoping to see uh, G Governor Nome uh, uh, welcome us. And uh, it's, it's just going to be a a tremendous opportunity for people to uh, to learn from each other, to network, to socialize and celebrate liberty or what's left of it. Well, excellent. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be there myself. I am in Canada for now, but our editor in chief, Michelle McCory, will be there to cover the event. I'm very much looking forward to it. Best of luck. It's going to be a great event. Great show. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you, David. Thank you for watching Keiko News. I'm David Lin. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow me on Twitter at DavidLin underscore TV.